Good morning and good afternoon. Um, my name is Ashley Kwan and I'm the Foundation Special Projects Coordinator. As we start, I'd like to acknowledge that I come to you from Toronto, which is the traditional lands of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. One of the things I am doing is learning what I can about these treaties so that I understand the history and intent of what was supposed to happen around the caretaking of this land. So I invite you to think about the ways, so I invite you to think about where you are and what that means for you and what that has meant over time. So good morning and good afternoon. We are thrilled to have you all here today as we come together to delve into the pressing issue of food security. Recent news articles highlight the alarming growth of food insecurity exacerbated by the levels of inflation we are witnessing. A recent report from Food Banks Canada has unveiled alarming statistics indicating the highest levels of food bank usage in Canadian history. This underscores the urgency of addressing this critical issue. And so today we're excited to present a panel of individuals undertaking vital work to combat food insecurity. So before we dive in, a couple of housekeeping. Um, this recording will be available after. Um, we'll send it in a follow-up email once it's uploaded to YouTube. We will also have a Q&A portion at the end and we invite you to ask your questions through the chat. Um, now I'm super excited to introduce everyone to our panel moderator today. Moderating our panel for today is Reverend Mary Royal Duzik. She currently serves as a minister at Almont United Church in Almont, Ontario. She is on the board of directors for the United Church of Canada Foundation and lives in Elmont with her husband and their eight-year-old daughter. Um, Mary, I'm going to give it to you to take it away. Okay, well, <clears throat> pardon me. Welcome, everyone. It's uh, wonderful to be here, and I'm so excited to have uh, the privilege of being the moderator for our uh, panel today and our time together. So my first task uh, is to introduce our panelists. We're so uh, thrilled to have um, them with us this morning. So I'm happy to introduce um, Linda Harrison, who's coming to us from the Brunswick Street Mission. And then just a little word about uh, Linda. Linda is the executive director of Brunswick Street Mission. Sorry, Warren, uh, it's Lisa. Yeah. Lisa. Sorry. <laughs> I thought I'd the bud. <laughs> we're off to a strong start. Um, Lisa. Lisa Harrison, that's what it says. Um, from the Brunswick Street Mission in Halifax, born in Anaganish, Nova Scotia, Lisa has had a varied career on both sides of the Atlantic. She found herself drawn to the not-for-profit world and went on to work at organizations focused on people's well-being, including a busy day center for unhoused people a skills academy for social care, and a national membership and training organization for supported housing. She happily joined Brunswick Street Mission in March 2023 and is very happy serving Halifax's diverse communities. So thank you for joining us, Lisa. Thank you. And as well, Emily Jacques from Maison St. Columba House in Montreal. Emily joined St. Columba House in 2002 as the preschool programs coordinator, which she continued doing for the following 17 years. Since 2008, she has been the family programs coordinator, overseeing the after school programs and day camps, as well as their alternate schools and youth programs. So welcome, Emily. We're so glad that you're here this morning or today. Thank you for having me. And then our other panelists come in a group of two, Beth Martin and Carolyn Gallup from Knox United Church in Lower Sackville, Nova Scotia. And so Beth is the chair of the church council of Knox United, and she brings more than 30 years of business and communications experience to the role. She is often found at the church during business hours, lending a hand wherever needed and is active with Freedom Kitchen. And then Carolyn is a member of Knox United Church since 2009 and is deeply passionate about community outreach. Serving as chair of outreach since 2014, she started a monthly community outreach meal event in collaboration with nine other community churches in 2016 and extended that to Freedom Kitchen and Closet in October of 2019. The Seeds of Hope grant, along with a grant from the federal government and the United Way, 
paved the way for a separate building and has become a hub in the community for those who are struggling with food. So welcome so much to our panelists. We're so glad that you're here with us and we're looking forward to hearing from your expertise and getting our imaginations running about uh, what we might be able to do to address food security. So uh, our first question to the panelists is even though I, I just briefly introduced you and your work, and now I would invite you to do it in your own words because perhaps there's something you wanted to highlight or emphasize for us. So Emily, I wonder if you could introduce yourself and provide a quick elevator pitch summarizing your respective project. Yes. Uh, so as you said, uh, Emily Jacques, I've been working at St. Columba House um, since 2002. Um, it's a, you know, it's a community organization that caters to, uh, I would say, two to 99 year olds. Uh, we have uh, many different programs. Um, and so, so yeah, so I've, I've been the programs, the family programs coordinator for the last five years. And in that capacity, I oversee our youth programming. And one of our programs projects that we started is what I'm going to talk about today. Um, our Cook to Connect program uh, was started in 2021. I think we kind of, we were offering, we had youth programming forever at St. Columba House. Um, and we already had a leadership program called Not Very Imaginative, but called LEAD. Um, and so uh, we kind of, we were looking at maybe what can we do? What else can we do to increase uh, self-esteem in the in in our youth and increase their skills and increase and uh, like you know a bunch of different things obviously like with our leadership program like soft skills and 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 that are one of our priorities but then we thought hmm, something's missing and so we uh, have the opportunity and the the to have a lunch program here every day so we have a cook on staff Mm -hmm. And so uh, we decided at a staff meeting that we were going to do a cooking project uh, with the youth. Obviously, um, the youth of today don't have, like, I remember even myself as a youth in school, we used to have home economics classes. Now there's none of that. So kids either learn at home, but often families are, you know, single parent families that are very busy. And so the opportunity to learn to cook is not always there. And so we thought, why not start a cooking project as part of our lead program um it's already it was already reaching about 15 to 20 youth um per year so we're like well let's let's just start a cooking program and so with the help of the seeds of hope foundation so we we kind of put together a proposal and then the program was started um and so once a month the kids uh got to get uh information about like food and information about uh you know what to buy what's healthy what's not healthy where to do groceries how to do groceries how to read how to read a can and see what's what's in there and what's good for you and what's not but also they got to cook and and really put their skills to the test with the help of our cook obviously and uh, and the youth program coordinator that was also there to to kind of help the the kids along um, the great thing about this is that they uh, got to cook a meal and uh, and bring it home to share with their family. And so uh, that was very well appreciated, I think, um, by the families. And also it's, it's a very proud moment um, for the youth, obviously, to bring something that they made home. And I have to say... Uh, most like most of the times the kids did very well like we're very uh even kids that don't necessarily have an attention span like this was very hands-on so it was very interesting for for all of the teens and they really 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 loved uh doing that project so yeah so that's that's uh that's about yeah what i can say about cook to connect great thank you so much for sharing that sounds so exciting um and beth and carolyn what can you tell us about your project Hi everybody. Uh, so I'm Beth and this is Caroline. Uh, so our Freedom Kitchen uh, started out of what was called the Come Meal. Uh, it was a community outreach meal event was what we called it. And that was the project that was with a number of other churches in our local area. And once a month, we have a, a large commercial kitchen here at our church. We're very fortunate. 
And so the other churches would come to our kitchen and prepare a meal so that we would rotate through as churches and everybody would prepare a meal throughout the year. Um, the need was becoming uh, sort of bigger than that. And that come event had sort of drawn in our senior uh, demographic of the community. But we knew there were a lot of youth and younger families and new to Canada families um, that were not coming to that, but the need for food was certainly very real. So from there, we grew to a food truck. We worked with the Salvation Army and they had a food truck in the area that we were able to prepare the meals here in our kitchen and then put them out on the food truck and serve from the local library as a sort of a takeout. And it just kept growing and growing and growing, but our community was very supportive behind us. So we sort of came up with this crazy idea that we would like to have a standalone building in the front of our church where we would still continue to make the meals in our kitchen, but we would serve them from the exterior building. And that's how it continues to operate to this day. But we've grown the first year we were serving you know, about 80 to 100 people mm -hmm. every Monday night. And we now plan for somewhere between 400 and 450 meals every Monday night. Um, so it's a, it's, it's, it's grown and it continues to grow and we're, we're keeping busy. <laughs> and we are getting the youth and families. Um, many families are coming out, even working families who can't make ends meet are coming to pick up meals on Monday night. Oh. Wonderful. Thank you so much. That's uh, yeah, that sounds very exciting. And uh, Lisa, uh, what do you want to tell us to briefly introduce yourself and your project? Uh, hi, yes. So um, as mentioned, I've been at Brunswick Street Mission uh, just for less than a year since the end of March. Um, and in the first half of the year, we got funding from Seeds of Hope uh, for uh, the addition of a part time outreach worker. Um, and uh, this was to allow um, us to do outreach into the encampments in, in the Halifax Regional Mis Municipality, uh, which we did as a pilot project. Um, what was interesting about what happened was that um, we went to the encampments and the way that we engaged with people was by taking warm cooked food to them and other, and other um, food that they could keep with them. Um, and we found that we weren't actually getting the kind of outcomes that we wanted by doing that. So we shifted the program and actually started focusing on our own breakfast program. Uh, Brunswick Street Mission serves breakfast to right now up to 80 or more people a day, Monday to Friday. Um, and we also have a food bank three days a week. So we're already very heavily focused on food security as an organization. Um, what we found was that by um, shifting our outreach worker from uh, the encampments around Halifax and actually um, embedding them in our breakfast program in the morning, um, it was a really good way to make connections with people who wanted to maybe didn't know about all our services and the network of services available to them across HRM. So um, for us, I often say that food's a bit like a Band-Aid, but also it's a little bit like bait as well. And you can get people into your services um, and then help them address some of the more, um, the, the deeper problems that they may be up against in their lives that have led them to the point where they're struggling to get food. Um, of course, people who use our services, some of them are students and some of them are in work as well. Uh, but we do have uh, quite a few people uh, who are unhoused um, and, and some who have quite chaotic lives who engage with our breakfast, breakfast program because it is the lowest barrier program. There's no registration or anything like that. Um, and we've actually been we've, we've been awarded a further grant from Seeds of Hope uh, starting from about now, which we're also using with our outreach program, focusing even more on the unhoused and, and their needs um, as we go forward into 2024. Um, so, I mean, I think for us, what it is, is like we we we, we keep trying to address uh, more of the root causes of why people are, are in the position that they're in. But the the food support is still absolutely key to, I'd say, over a thousand people a month that we engage with. And that includes the families and children who use our, our food bank. Um, so it's it's sort of it's not a, a project that's discreet, but rather one that's absolutely integrated into the work that we do as an organization. Wonderful. Yeah, just so so great to, uh, to hear about all of these projects. So now we'll dig a little bit deeper into a bit more about the work that you're doing. And so uh, the next question is, what needs in your particular community were you aiming to address? And how did you address them? Uh, and then perhaps in addition to that, um, what impacts have you witnessed in, in your community? And what outcomes have you witnessed so far? And Beth and Carolyn, do you want to take that one first? 
I'm just gonna. Um, it's it's hard for me to measure impact, but I think uh, the fact that people come regularly for meals, and people uh, come to us regularly for food hampers as well. We're not a food bank per se, uh, but we we um, provide emergency food hampers for people who find themselves uh, in a situation that they they really weren't prepared for. Maybe their car broke down, they had to use their grocery money to buy medication. Um, somebody is sick in the hospital and they have to take time off and be with them. They've lost their job. It takes a while to get registered at a food bank and get on the list. So what we do is we provide an emergency hamper to get people over the hump until they can get into a food bank and get some help. Um, we also give gift cards out to people who need help. And uh, I guess if showing gratitude and thanking us for all that we do in the community on a regular basis, um, I guess that's how we measure our outcome. Um, we also have so many partnerships in the community that continue to collaborate with us as we provide the different services. We also provide winter wear for people. So we do coats and boots mostly for all ages, uh, little ones to adults. And um, uh, this year we collaborated with the Knights of Columbus on the coats for kids. And we were able to um, give out almost 200 coats in the month of October, November, December. And um, I, I think um, it, that's a testament to the need and it's a testament to the fact that so many people um, appreciate that we can, they can make an appointment, they can come privately, there's no stigma attached and their privacy is respected and they can try on coach just like they do at Walmart and other stores and um, can walk out with, with a coat um, hats, mitts, everything that they need. One of the big things that we've noticed is that we're getting a lot, a huge diverse population um, that's moved into Sackville and to get, I guess, started in their new homes. Uh, they've reached, uh, many have reached out to us to help them um, get established and to find out where other services are and to get some help um, right away. So um, I hope I answered the question. <laughs> Absolutely, thank you. I would also just say that one of the largest impacts that we have found sort of as a trickle down effect is that not only are we able to make the direct connection with our clients and those that are in need, but as a result of filling that need, we are approached on a continual basis from community, other community groups like the Knights of Columbus. We've worked with um, our local legion. Last night, we had a U14 hockey team in that was working and filling uh, bags for our senior, adopt a senior program. Um, and we have fantastic community partners that will contact us and say, you know, okay, you guys must be getting down on protein. Um, I just saw pork on sale at ABC Mart. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to go buy 400 pounds. Who's going to be around to collect it? Mm -hmm. um, so when we get those phone phone calls, we say, name a time that's good for you. We'll be here. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so those are the other types of things that are stopping to happen. So, you know, the impact goes beyond putting the food in the bellies of, but it goes into the larger community where the community groups that can start to contact and say, hey, how can we can how can we get involved? And that just allows their reach to grow. Yeah, it's the pride of community that we're seeing in Sackville because people are so happy to be able to share and work together. I just wanted to make one more comment on volunteers. We have um, a core group of 50 to 60 volunteers that have been with Beth and I since we started in um, uh, 2021. And I think that's a testament 
as well to um, the impact that we're having because the volunteers don't stick around if they don't feel that they're um, making a difference in people's lives. And so I think um, the fact that our volunteers are um, with us every week doing what we do um, speaks for how they feel that they're impacting their community and the people in the community. So. Thank you so much. It's just, yeah, absolutely wonderful. Thank you. And uh, so the same question about um, the, uh, the impacts and how the community has responded um, to you, Emily. Uh, yeah, so our our program, obviously, you know, the goals of our, our, our youth program was always to teach youth uh, how to plan, budget, shop, prepare nutritious, affordable meals. Um, and this is because obviously you did mention that we're in Montreal. Uh, more specifically, we are in Point St. Charles, which is a um, quite a low income neighborhood. Obviously, uh, gentrification is uh, is a reality for us. It has been for quite a few years, uh, which just makes the divide even bigger, I think, between uh, rich families and poor and poor families, obviously. Um, and so most of the, the teens that we get in our, our Cook to Connect program are teens that are um, at risk youth, obviously. Um, and so, um, you know, the thing that made us kind of want to start this program is that within Point St. Charles, there is limited youth programming uh, in place. Uh, and most of the programming that is in place is uh, pretty much all in French. And most of the youth that we do service uh, are Anglophone uh, youth. So, um, you know, there is a YMCA in the point, but it's more a drop in center. So something that's quite organized, programming that's organized for youth, um, it's, it's quite sparse. And so, and there's no cooking programs for teens or youth. There are for children. Weirdly, um, there's uh, programs for children, but none for youth, even in the Southwest borough where we are. Uh, so we thought that was a need that we could fill, definitely. Uh, and as I mentioned before, there's, you know, adults are, pre are preparing like fewer foods at home, uh, which has led to a higher number of children not being involved in food preparation at all. And so, um, you know, I talked before about our, our the families that come to uh, user services and 46.2% of the families that we have are single parent families, which is, which is quite a high number. Um, also, um, there's quite a large Ang Anglophone population in the point uh, compared to any other neighborhood in Montreal. Um, there's quite a lot of, there's 24.8% of families or that are uh, English speaking. And so we do need services for them. And so St. Columbus House prides itself on being a first Anglophone center, but bilingual. I think over the years we've become uh, more and more bilingual, um, but we still service quite a lot of the Anglophone population. So that was one reason uh, behind it. Um, also, you know, engaging this, engaging children in this uh, youth in this project uh, was definitely put in place to uh, build confidence and self esteem. Uh, that's much needed for at risk at risk youth. Um, and so, yeah, and the impact that we've seen uh, over the over the, the course of the, the project, obviously, you know, our youth, our 15 youth that participated left here with so much, so much uh, education about food, so much, so many information and actually techniques on how to cook and how to to do this and, and repeat this at home. Um, also, uh, we tried to uh, teach them about uh, creating healthy food habits because obviously fast food is, is what it's called for what it's called. It's fast and it's easy. And so, uh, but it's not necessarily what's best for you. So we tried to instill in them that, you know what, cooking a meal will take you a bit more time, but in the long run, the effects are so much better for you. So I think um, most, although, you know, teens are teens and they will, they will eat fast food. Obviously I have one at home, loves fast food. Um, but, um, you know, it's important to teach them that it's not the best and there are other options, obviously. Uh, we also, I think we saw an increase in, in the youth confidence, I think, uh, and the self-esteem because to bring something home 
uh, to your family that you've made is quite exciting. Um, you know, I have to, I have to, well, I'll, a, a tidbit of my life, my son was in the Cook to, to Connect project. And so I saw firsthand the joy on his face to bring home like baked mac and cheese or chili or that we got to share with his father. Like I saw that firsthand. And so definitely increased self-esteem. And, you know, just, just giving them life skills, just giving them life skills that they'll be able to use uh, in their life. You know, most of the teens that we had were 14, 15, I would say. And so it, it's still that time to give them those life skills and make sure that uh, they leave here with, with skills that they can use in their everyday life. And so, yeah, they got to prepare uh, nine different meals over the nine months. And um, yeah, they got to prepare different things. And so, you know, they got to bring that home. And and uh, I think that was the, the greatest impact, I think. So, yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, and Lisa, the same question to you about uh, the impact and the community response. Thanks. Um, uh, well, I mean, the the one of the benefits of this program in terms of um, having uh, an additional part time outreach worker um, was that there was actually increased food support for marginalized people within our community uh, and an increased number of client intakes uh, into our outreach program via the breakfast program and also the outreach into the encampments. Um, it also, in a longer term way, changed the way we work in that we really started integrating our social worker into our food delivery program so they could engage with people there um, when they come in. Um, just in the six months that were funded by Seeds of Hope, um, our outreach worker recorded 542 um, separate interactions with our breakfast guests. And through these interactions, she provided 54 referrals to other programs, both internally and externally, as well as community services, uh, and gave 17 mental health supports. Um, also, um, having our outreach worker at breakfast, um, whether whether it was a coincidence or a result, there was a marked increase in the number of women who were attending breakfast as well, because we think because there was a, a woman on site um, who was engaging with the guests. Um, yeah, uh, since the beginning of the year, the number of breakfasts and the people that we're engaging with, especially from the unhoused community, is increasing and, and increasing as the year goes on. Um, and so... I mean, I guess the community response would be to appreciate what we're doing and keep showing up in greater and greater numbers. Um, we, we've been working really hard to ensure that, you know, our our approach to the people who use our services is dual pronged, both supplying them with the food that they need, but also trying to engage them with the services that they might need as well. And that could be anything from housing to just a nice chat and, an, and a warm office, if you know what I mean. Um yeah, I mean, but we, we're going to continue to work in this way. And I think it's great that we had the opportunity to have a little bit of um, slack, I suppose, <laughs> in our daily day, in our days to have the extra outreach worker to be able to to kind of um, experiment with how they were working rather than being constantly completely reactive. Because then uh, we had a, our social worker and an outreach worker for a period as well. And, uh, and going forward, I will always aim to have at least two people doing that. And currently we're filling that gap by having a social work student, um, a sister social worker in much the same way. So we've just realized we need more people, <laughs> you know, and uh, and uh, and as an organization, you know, food's really important, but I, I want us to always have uh, the kind of the professional help that people need on site as well. Thank you so much um, for sharing with us uh, all of this information. Um, so, Folks who are on the call uh, may be aware that the foundation has named four foundational pillars. And so it's anti-racism, reconciliation with Indigenous peoples, climate justice, and communities of faith are these four uh, foundational pillars. And so do you have any comments to speak to how your project takes up and engages with one or some of these priorities? Or what ways can we ensure that the diversity of backgrounds, cultures, and experiences are being addressed as we take steps towards food security? And Emily, do you want to start us off there? Sure, sure. I think um, 
anti-racism is an important principle we try to weave into various aspects of our different projects especially with the youth you know um with everything that's going on in the world i think uh, anti-racism and anti-oppression has been very much at the forefront of of the news and of everything um that's that's been going on and so um when it comes to our teen cooking project you know we have to remember it's part of a larger uh larger project which is our lead program and so there are several ways we actively addressed and engaged with anti-racism uh, on a weekly basis um so there's three things that we um, usually do in, in that programming. Um, so diverse representation, obviously uh, the community of Point St. Charles is quite diverse. Um, you know, there's uh, people from different like different communities and different backgrounds. And there's a lot of immigration uh, that happened and, and people move into the point, into what we call the point. Um, and so obviously our Cook to Connect teams Kind of represent the, the the community as like they were children of the, the the people that live in the community and so just themselves are very quite diverse um from different various like racial and ethnic backgrounds the second thing we do is uh cultural awareness workshops we've had many workshops many people coming uh in to talk about uh you know more educational components uh, that focus like on, on cultural awareness, on, on sensitivity uh, and understanding, um, you know, of, of how to be sensitive and how to kind of interact in this world. That's, you know, especially Montreal is very, very, uh, you know, in all the schools and all the, it's very diverse. And so um, to teach sensitivity and to teach all of that to kids is very important for us. Um, and the last thing is, is we always have an open dialogue on racism. Obviously, we have many teens that come to our program uh, each week that actually have examples of of them being uh, at the hand of racism and being stopped by a, a police or being, you know, or, or getting comments from, from different people. And so obviously having an open dialogue is very important for them to be able to express themselves. Um, and so we wanna create, we always uh, st strive to create a safe and open space for teens to be uh, comfortable sharing these things. Um, and so, yeah, we encourage dialogue about, you know, personal experiences, per but also on perceptions. A lot of kids, you know, because of families or families that have, you know, we have a very strong Irish community in the point. And, um, you know, sometimes there's preconceptions about races or ethnic backgrounds or, and so we try to break those down or, or break those down or to explain like where it's coming from and things like that. And then, you know, obviously also the impact of systemic uh, racism on those kids, because a lot of those kids do uh, feel the systemic racism. So, so yeah, it's it's something that's very important for us at St. Clemas and something that we include even with our younger kids in our other programming, but because it's something that's very present. But yeah, that's how we kind of address that situation. Great, thank you so much. And Lisa? <clears throat> uh, yes, in terms of the foundational pillars, I mean, the one I think that we could most uh, the most uh, align ourselves would would, would be anti-racism as well. I mean, we work with a really broad range of people where we are on the north end of Halifax, um, including many people of color and newcomers from across the globe. We're seeing more and more different people from different parts of the world uh, holding a range of religious beliefs. And also we engage with the LGBTQ um, IA2S community as well. Um, and I think one of the reasons that we feel so welcoming to people is we made a real effort to be very um to have be very inclusive in terms of our recruitment of volunteers we've got quite a, a much more diverse group of volunteers than we had say five years ago um and, and that's part of our hiring practices and recruitment as well we do we have a big focus on inclusion and diversity um also i mean just in terms of the kinds of um foods that we offer in our food bank we've, we've worked really hard to um uh, you know, but we, we get most of our food from Feed Nova Scotia, but every month we spend a further $5,000 bringing in other foods, uh, such as spending, I think it's about over, it's over $1,000 a month on halal meat, you know, so people can get what they want and 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 things for various types of diets as well, and different, different preferences that people have. Um, so yeah, it's, it's part and parcel of, of how we operate. Thank you so much. And to you, Beth and Carolyn. Uh, yeah, so for us, um, you know, we certainly, we are an affirming congregation. So, uh, you know, we advertise, you know, we have an electronic sign that rotates through on the outside of our building. And one of the sayings on that is that 
all are welcome in this place, all are welcome by God's grace. And and we we don't just put that on our building, we live that. So everybody uh, in the community, and even those that are a little hesitant to come initially, um, after their first visit, they, they know that they are welcome and it doesn't matter where they come from, what language they speak, what God they worship, or if they worship, um, it's, they are still welcome. Um, so that's something that uh, we've been very uh, intentional about um, from the very beginning. And, and again, like for, for us, it just goes back to the community of faith. So for us, that is our congregation who support us with donations. Um, here in Nova Scotia, a lot of um, organizations, uh, Lisa just said that they're part of Feed Nova Scotia. So that's the large umbrella organization that takes food donations in through a variety of different ways and has many multiple partnerships. Um, and then they have these affiliate organizations that they're uh, partnered with. We've been on the waiting list to become one of those affiliates for about three years now. Um, so we are not an affiliate of Feed Nova Scotia. But in a way, I think that does give us a little bit of a, a different opportunity in that the community knows that everything that comes through Freedom Kitchen and Closet comes from the community. So it has uh, really built and um, continues to evolve that community ownership, that community belonging. Um, so that it's going, you know, it's yes, it's in our congregation, but it is in our local community as well. Um, so, you know, those are the types of things where we we will see something and we're like, okay, how can we how can we make it better? How can we um, you know, if it worked here, what about if it works over there? So we 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 just continue to build on relationships and um, you know, that community of faith is a very there's that's a very important um pillar for us. I just want to add to that that um, we've uh, been using our phone translators quite a bit with anybody who comes um, so that we can communicate um, more easily. And most of our families who are coming from the Ukraine are finding that very helpful. Um, and we're also um, starting to get more applications from diverse populations to come and volunteer. So that is good as well, because it tells me that they really want to become part of the community. And um, so we're opening our doors to that as well, so. Wonderful, thank you so much for all this sharing. So now we have some, times, uh, some time for questions. So if you have a question for our panelists, if you could type it into the chat, then um, we will have some time to address it. And if we have more questions than time, we'll find a way um, to get some answers to you. So there may already be a few questions in the chat. Some of you may be typing your questions in. So yes, yeah, so our first question, um, uh, question for Beth and Carolyn, how has your program transformed your community of faith? Go ahead. As we look at each other. <laughs> um, it has, so in Lower Sackville here at Knox, uh, you know, I think we share a very similar um, risk that a lot of other Canadian churches and global churches are finding in that our demographic is aging and our congregation was declining in number of attendants. Um, but there's a lot of people in that demographic that are really good, strong, um, they're, they're workers and they're not ready to give up on Knox. And uh, so when we started Freedom Kitchen, we had um, a lot of people uh, that were, uh, came, came to the front and said, you know, how can I volunteer and what can I do? And when we put an appeal out, you know, this month we would really like to have some cans of cranberry sauce because we're doing our turkey dinner uh, this coming Monday, we will serve 400 full turkey meals um, to our clients uh, in celebration of Christmas. Um, we have seen a resurgence of younger families starting to come to Knox. Last week, we did three baptisms. Um, so we have, um, you know, we, we just keep 
we just we just keep going. We're that little bus that keeps going up the hill saying we think we can, we think we can. Mm -hmm. um, and our community of faith has embraced us. Um, we've had a lot going on within the congregation as well. We've gone through two ministers in the last two years and mm -hmm. we've had we've dealt with COVID and we were deemed an essential service through COVID. So we kept operating with a with a very committed um, core group of volunteers. Uh, and we, we just keep going. <laughs> I'm, I'm finding that some of the feedback that we're getting from newcomers to our church is that they've heard about Freedom Kitchen. And so um, they are coming to our church because they want to be involved in the, the outreach component of our church. So they're signing up to volunteer very quickly after coming to our church. So um, it, it tells me that really people want to be involved with the community and they want to get to know people and they, they want to help people in the community in any way they can. So. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and then we have a question. I manage two organizations called Exer Farm and Deep Roots Food Hub. We'd like to collaborate with our local United Church in CARP and would appreciate some advice on how to do that. So are any of your organizations collaborating um, with other churches or created partnerships with local churches to you to do some of the work together somehow? Yeah, Beth and Carolyn? Uh, well, like we mentioned before, we certainly, that was sort of how we evolved into Freedom Kitchen was from our community outreach meal event, the come event. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I, I'm taking from the, the deep roots, can't see the full converse, can't see the full comment now, um, deep roots food hub. Uh, here in the Lower Sackville area, uh, one of the community groups uh, from Acadia Hall, they have started um, a square roots program, found a, a program that uh, one Saturday a month, I think it is, that you can purchase a fresh bag of produce from local farmers uh, for $10 a bag. So it's a very uh, reasonable and cost-effective way to get fresh produce. Um, now, they're usually, you know, they're kind of the the non-marketable. So, you know, you might get a carrot that looks like a, a man, I mean, like a man <laughs> walking along, uh, or you might have a turnip that looks more like a Watermelon. Watermelon. <laughs> yes. Uh, potatoes can be heart shaped. You never know what you're going to get when you get, you know, you know what vegetables you're going to get, but what shapes they're going to be, in, <laughs> you don't know. Um, but what will happen is they take orders for X number of bags um, in the month, but then they'll order additional because they will get just drop ins to purchase the bags off of, you know, from people off the street. On that Saturday, it is probably a 95% chance that either my cell phone or Caroline's cell phone is going to ring. And it's the operators of that program calling us to say that they have 20 extra bags of produce. So could they um, drop it off to us? Mm -hmm. We have yet to say no to anybody that phones and says, I have extra whatever, can you accommodate? Uh, our answer is always, yes, we can accommodate. Uh, a couple of years ago, we had a... Um, a donation of two pallets of chocolate milk. Um, and that sounds fantastic to have that amount of milk, um, but storage of two pallets of milk is, is a big issue for us. So we put it out on social media and that is something that we try to keep on top of. Our Facebook page is very active um, and the Facebook Messenger is how a lot of people reach out to us. We do have a website, but really, I think our Facebook page takes more precedence than our than our website. Um, and so, you know, for us, it's just it's that relationship building. Like it just you you have to put the energy in to make the relationships, keep the relationships, and then keep going with new ones. Um, I just want to mention too that we do two uh, what we call food rescues with Cobb's bread uh, twice a week and we bring that back to our building and we bag it and we give it out free. We also have a partnership with a pet food company, Globe Food, food Pet Company, and uh, if they get a bag with a tear or um, 
maybe it's coming close to its due date, they call us. We send somebody, they pick up the pet food, we bring it back, we give it away. And we're also have a partnership with um, Second Harvest. So we do uh, pickups at Sobeys grocery stores um, three times a week and bring the food back and um, uh, put that out for uh, the taking too. It's like an outdoor shelves, um, like a pantry and um, so we put a lot of food out for the taking besides um, where we rescue the food that would have gone to the landfill. And um, so we are able to put out a lot of food for people to come and help themselves uh, three times a week. Yeah. And, and to Dr. Bruce, who asked about how to collaborate with the local United Church, uh, just, just make the initial contact, uh, whether there's an admin in the office or whether there's, you know, you have a way to get a hold of the minister, they should be able to get you in touch if they have an outreach program. I don't, I don't even know where CARP is. So um, I don't know how large a town you're in or not, or how active the United Church is there. Uh, I see two new messages. Uh, done and refused. Wow. Can't imagine. Oh. God, wow. Um, yeah. Huh? That's that's a that's that's an interesting one. Mm -hmm. um, All you have to do is find one person who's yeah. passionate or who's passionate mm -hmm. about food insecurity, and then you're off to the races. But when I first became involved in um, 2016, it was through the county councilors that I became aware that there was a real issue in the community. And from there, um, we grew. Outside of Ottawa. But okay. the minister of this church at the time was very concerned about food insecurity and um, people that were coach surfing and homeless. And so I had his support as well. So uh, you have to find that person. Um, He's found volunteers. Dr. Bruce, if you would like to get... Mine or, mine or Caroline's direct contact information from um, the administrators of this webinar, I would I would certainly be okay with wow. responding back and forth with you. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, we have another question, um, a question for Emily. Mm -hmm. How does your cooking program help the youth participants connect to their cultural identities? Yes, well, that's that's a good one. Uh, we often, I think, when we first started uh, the project, one of the first discussion they had was about what are you like? What do you eat? What it, like do you at home? Do you make like traditional food? Do you make like more North American food? So it's a discussion we had, uh, and also we did. Um, you know, obviously we couldn't cook from all the, there's so many different cultures. We couldn't do uh, cooking from all of the cultures, but we ended up uh, doing paratha, which is uh, kind of like a flatbread uh, from uh, from uh, Bangladesh. We have a lot of youth from Bangladesh. And so, and then we also made fried plantains for our, uh, for our, our Asian community, community. And so, yeah, so we talk about it. Uh, they talked about what kinds of foods uh, they're used to eating and what kinds of food they like making and, and stuff like that. So, yeah, so we did have, we did try to get them to connect and to share also their, their cultural um, backgrounds. Great. Thank you. So um, it's, we've got time for uh, one more question. So we're, uh, we've got a question around financials. So um, the practical piece of financials for these three amazing programs, and perhaps as well, if you wanted to give um, our uh, participants today any information on what the process was like of coming to the decision to apply for a Seeds of Hope grant at the foundation and any advice um, you wanted to give our participants around that. Uh, Lisa, do you want to start? Sure. Um, <laughs> the financials. Um, I mean, the Seeds of Hope grant, we we approach Seeds of Hope because we're actually an incorporated ministry of the United Church, which doesn't really mean anything specific other than that we're sort of, um, the, the, the mission was previously run by volunteers from the Brunswick Street United Church. And then in the 
early the 2000s, uh, we became an independent um, organization. Um, but we still have a very strong connection to United Church. We're in a United Church. Um, so Seeds of Hope for us is, is just one of the sources that we go to uh, in terms of where we apply. Um, and the application process, I mean, if, if people want advice on that, um, you know, uh, detail <laughs> and, and, and have some very specific outcomes about how you want to work and how it's going to have an impact and, and be very specific about what that impact is. Um, at the Brunswick Street Mission, um, where we have seven employees, we're going to soon have eight and we've got placements and we've got over 50 volunteers. Um, it costs over $600,000 a year to run our organization. Um, and that's with all that free food from Feed Nova Scotia as well, if you can imagine. Um, but um, so, I mean, Seeds of Hope is part of a network of, of, of incomes that we have. We have donors and donations, a lot of which come through uh, people who are um, congregants of the United Church, especially our eight affiliated churches around um, Halifax Regional Municipality. But we also approach trusts and foundations as well for funds, uh, really trying to get some some more money out of Department of Community Services and Province of Nova Scotia and stuff like that to have them acknowledge that we're actually delivering services in Halifax to Nova Scotians that are absolutely required. Um, so, I mean, uh, uh, in terms of finances, uh, I will say to people, all I ever think about is money. I think about it all day long. <laughs> and I'm, I'm sure everybody else can relate to that. Um, I don't know. If, I'm, I'm sure other people have different ways of working. I mean, and, and as well, having, oh, we have 50 volunteers. We've really increased our number of volunteers um, over the last couple of years. And we've, we've, we've brought in a full-time volunteer coordinator uh, to, to reflect how much time and work uh, it takes to kind of in, attract people and, and, and do their, uh, you know, uh, teach them about the organization and manage them as well. So, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I've taught it up, you know, our volunteers are at least like another three full-time employees worth of people on site, um, you know, and, and there's a lot that goes in there. So, um, but yeah, we, I mean, basically running the mission is like running a, a, a business, really. There's a lot that, that goes into it. Great. Thank you. And Emily? Uh, yeah, so the for for one, if you're looking to apply for Seeds of Hope, the the um, I think Ashley, I think it was just put on the the chat, but the the website is quite useful. Uh, it's it's very clear. I think uh, one thing that stands out is uh, when you're looking for funding. Obviously, we are a United Church mission, so obviously Seeds of Hope is for the same as Lisa is, is uh, a funding that we go towards, like for different projects. Um, and so uh, one thing that comes out is uniqueness. So how is your project unique you know and how is your project they have different kind of uh different kind of umbrellas under so they they will fund programs for for youth and for for uh, children and youth and then for seniors for so it's quite uh, it's quite well uh documented and well explained on the website uh and for us obviously you know we always say in the community organization world that we do so much with nothing uh obviously most of our budget is spent on salaries because the rest of like our programming we just do uh, with very little money. Um, but obviously a, pro a project like Cook to Connect, you need money for. Obviously we had to buy all the equipment to have the stations for the youth to be able to do their own cooking. We have one kitchen. We can't have 15 youth in one tiny little kitchen. Um, so we had to buy like the hot plates and the woks and the, the utensils. So obviously this is a project that would not have happened without Seeds of Hope and other funders because it's quite expensive to buy all of these things. And so so, so yeah, so definitely um, came in handy to get extra money for that project. Obviously, without this funding, that project would never have happened. Uh, as part of our regular activity, you know, we like it, it's we don't have that much money to spend on one project. So, so yeah, so it was very we were very grateful to get that money and to get that project started. Uh, yeah. So that's that's but the website is very very uh, clear and uh, and the, the the application of it is not it's not too, it's not complicated it's quite simple it's quite straightforward um, so yeah so yeah that's it for me great thank you and to Beth and Carolyn we are not proud of where our money comes from we will take any and all money that is offered. <laughs> Um, we uh, certainly operate on a shoestring. Um, believe it or not, probably the largest expense for us is actually containers to put the food in. We get a lot of uh, food donated and we have a lot of community partners. 
Um, but really purchasing the containers that we put the meals in to deliver uh, every week, that is one of our largest expenditures. Um, it's, it's crazy how much uh, you know, a tinfoil plate will cost that has a lid that can be you know, fastened to serve something warm in. Um, so we've started to go uh, to various container stores and get a supplier. And if we can find out that you know, that plate came from Alcan, I'm just making it up. It must, I must've seen it on a label somewhere. Um, we'll try and find the company so that we can get, you know, do they have any end of product lines? My brother happens to work for a plastic manufacturer, so I'm always after him. What, what do you have that you're going to throw away? We'll take it. Um, and uh, those are the types of things for us, the seeds of foundation. Uh, one of the questions that was unans unanswered before was how did we get funding for the uh, standalone building outside? Um, it was through grants um, and we found Seeds of Hope and we applied and they gave us $10,000 towards that structure. Uh, but then we had federal money, we had United Way money, we had personal donations. We All the labor was donated. All the labor, yeah, as Caroline said, was donated. Uh, one of the, one of our, one of our success stories and it, it just keeps our heart, while we're up at night worrying about money, what keeps our heart warm and going is um is one of our clients that we've known for four years now and his he goes by snake he continues to go by snake and when we first met snake he was living in a hand dug shelter uh in the Sackville River uh bed um and he came to our freedom kitchen meal when we were serving out of the food truck down at the library uh so he was living rough um and he uh, has a very, a very interesting and diverse, uh, you know, history um, that he shared with us and, and has said that we're okay to share as well. So he has, you know, been through the system, um, didn't have a lot of trust in the system, maybe not a whole lot of trust in humanity left when we first met him. Um, but he became a regular uh, and he is now uh, living a very good stable life and is is doing well and last he built like when he knew that we were going to be building the standalone building one of his careers throughout his lifetime was as a roofer uh, so he helped there's not an inch of that building that snake did not help build mm. um, and last year uh, another another one of his careers was as a landscaper so last year he mowed all of our lawns and he put fresh mulch underneath all of our trees and he took care of our garden beds. So um, there is so much more payback than like financial is one thing, but it's that it's that connection to everybody that comes out of this as well. And we have we have people that volunteer with us that are our clients, but you know they know they can't. They can't pay for their meal that they're getting on Monday, but they can donate a couple of hours Saturday morning. So they come and they help, you know, sort of get the the bread and the food items that we receive and put them out on the shelves and get the shelves out onto the deck so that people come and, and get things in an orderly manner. So, um, you know, those are some of the things that we are so blessed to have beyond the financial funding. But let's face it, when it comes to finances, we are out there constantly trying to find, okay, who, who will fund us for this? Who will fund us for that? Um, but Seeds of Hope, you know, as a United Church Foundation and, and program, that was that was an easy one for us to find. We didn't have to look very hard for it, but uh, we, we were certainly grateful for the benefit of their, their uh, contribution to our building. Wonderful. My husband, my oh. husband is a great grant writer too. He, um, He's raised a lot of money through grant writing for the church. So. Yeah, we just, uh, one of the things, our commercial kitchen is, uh, we do have a large kitchen. We're very grateful for it. However, one of the things that happened um, recently was that um, our fire inspector came in. And even though it has been grandfathered for years with this new fire inspector, he came in and said, we needed a new fire suppression system in our kitchen, plus we had to install an industrial hood. So that cost of that update to our kitchen is somewhere between 80 and $120,000. Uh, 
Um, so seeds of hope, stay tuned. You never know. Uh, <laughs> oh, it's, it's already going in. Okay, there we go. <laughs> and and uh, so we've, um, you know, we have we have been able to cover the cost of that through uh, Fred, Caroline's husband. He he has been reaching out, um, and uh, and we we now have that cost. That project is now covered as well. So it's just being that like going after being the dog with the bone and going after a bigger bone every time. <laughs> and I, I always say when you go to bed at night and you pray for things, God seems to be with us and seems to be providing what we need. So um, we just keep on doing what we, what we do. So. Wonderful. Well, we've reached the appointed, uh, slightly just past the appointed time uh, of our time together today. So I want to offer a huge thank you to our panelists for the gift of sharing your expertise with us, for the gift of your time being here today, and um, just offering us uh, so much uh, to think about moving forward as we all work together on this gospel call that Jesus calls us to of feeding the hungry and really working um, to achieve food security. So thank you so much to our panelists. Thank you so much to our participants today. And if you have specific questions um, about how a Seeds of Hope grant might be a good fit for a food security project you want to do in your area, please reach out to the foundation staff. They have all kinds of information on how um, that might be a good fit. So thank you, everyone for your time today. And thank you to our panelists. And I offer you blessings as you go from this time together. Thank Thanks you. for having us.